Hey guys, so today is a video we've been trying to make for like a year and a half, but we haven't been able to. You see, Case and I are both young guys, and we are both into weird old Mercedes, and in this video, we're gonna do your ultimate guide to young guy Mercedes ownership, what it costs, what the pros are, what the cons are, um, and we're gonna go through two very different models, my 1982 and Case's 72. Yeah, exactly, exactly 10 years apart. So yep. Case, what is that beauty over there? And tell me how you got it. Yeah, this is my, well, it was my great grandfather's 1972 W108 Mercedes 280 SEL. So it's the extended wheelbase, uh, 4.5 liter fuel injected V8. Um, some pretty surprisingly high tech stuff on this car for a 72, which we'll get into a little later. But uh, it was funny, the first day of my internship at TFL, Tommy was sitting across from me frustratedly trying to fix this little miniature drone and the first that he noticed I was actually there is when I mentioned that I had this car so he and I have always been kind of buddies over this uh, over this love of vintage Mercedes love hate yeah vintage Mercedes. love hate for sure yeah so this is you said a 108 right yep which kind of if you follow the progression of Mercedes this would have been like the s-class right before the s-class right yeah. before the s-class but yeah. this kind of turned into the s-class pretty much yeah. uh yeah it, it would have been i'm pretty sure the next generation after this that was actually an s-class by name but this still carries a lot of that s-class kind of high-tech surprisingly sophisticated and luxurious stuff on it it's got three point seat belts fully independent suspension four-wheel disc brakes like i mentioned it's fuel injected uh, it's also got central locking, power windows, and the central locking works on a vacuum system, but it works. Um, actually, well, yeah, I would have to hit the lock plunger on the driver's side, but uh, they're just beautifully built cars. The interior and that dashboard, one of my favorite things about it, uh, I'm still working on a number of things with this car. It's unfinished. That's why my radio is sticking out like that. But um, yeah, these, these are just such cool cars to look at. They're beautiful. So from a style perspective, I personally think that this is one of the prettiest Mercedes of all time, especially in this color. Now, when you got this car, it was like what, yellow? Yeah, it was like a mustard yellow color, which um, is just not my personal favorite. Uh, it, it looked very kind of just <laughs> uh, But I love the way that it sits right now, silver and with the bright polished hubcaps, because originally from the factory, the center of the hubcaps would have been color matched the paint. Oh, interesting. Uh, so having those completely polished and all the bright work on this car, it's just about the shiniest object on the road. So every time I take it everywhere, anywhere, every single time someone makes a comment about it, people just love it because I think mainly it's, it's so shiny. <laughs> so let me contrast that to mine. Most people don't notice mine because it kind of looks like a Moroccan taxi cab, but this is a 1982 Mercedes. This was called the W123. Um, and unlike cases that was kind of the predecessor to the S-Class, this one was the predecessor to the E-Class. So kind of a very different era of Mercedes, um, especially in the design. So one thing that really separates these two are like Casey's car has the vertical headlights and it probably originally would have been stacked. Whereas by the late seventies, they had gone to the horizontal squared off design. Are these Euro headlights? Talk to you about these. Yeah, yeah. So this is like the more kind of classic style of headlight and the waterfall look to it. Uh, it's not the sealed beam US regulation headlights that you had to have here. Uh, these particular ones that I have aren't in amazing shape. So I kind of had to go through and build out the actual light functions of them. At some point, I would love to get a very original uh, set of good condition Euro headlights with all just the factory incandescent bulbs hooked up the way that they would have worked from the factory. But um, in a pinch, this, this works fine. I love on your headlights, these <laughs> ambers. That's just the coolest thing. Anytime you can have ambers on a car or a truck, my truck has ambers, it just looks great. I love that. Yeah, the fogs are pretty cool, but um, certainly it doesn't have like kind of that eye popping appeal like the older ones. I mean, it is a handsome car. There's no doubt that it certainly has a very kind of proud look to it. But of course, um, incorporated down in the front and the back are the American spec bumpers. So we did have to have these giants. I think these were 10 mile an hour uh, crash rated bumpers. Whereas if you go with an early 70s car like Cases, you had the super streamlined bumpers. Um, and then Case, shouldn't you have turn signals here? What happened to those? Yeah, so from the factory, this car would have had more trinkets on it. They had these big turn signals right here in between the grill and the headlights and then around the side. 
It also had side marker lights. Those just came on with the headlights. They didn't actually flash for the turn signals or anything. They had them front and back. Uh, but when I had the car repainted, we went ahead and just shaved those to simplify the body, clean up the lines and everything. I've heard some people say before, oh, you shouldn't have shaved those side marker lights. You know, uh, it's going to make your car less visible. But it, again, it's the shiniest vehicle in the world. It's like, you're, you're just, you're not going to miss it. I'm not worried about it. So I think we're both in agreement from a design standpoint. Uh, cases are just cooler. I mean, these W108s are just amazing cars to look at. Then again, I mean, you're, what, what I love about this car is this hasn't been repainted. You have how many miles on it? 150,000? 150,000, so three times as many miles, and it's just in such incredibly good condition, interior and exterior. So it's funny, both Tommy and I are kind of like uh, self-loathing Mercedes <laughs> owners. He always jokes about the fact that his car, he says, is boring, and I always joke about the fact that everything on my car is just falling apart. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, I, I really, I, I think your Mercedes is so cool. I just love how clean it is. Well, I appreciate that, and yours too, but let's pop the hood and talk about the engines and uh, what powers these beasts here, Al. Yeah, absolutely. Is yeah, there a right under there. Ah. Uh -huh. Wow, look at that. Yeah, 4.5 liter V8. Like I said, fuel injected. We recently went through and redid the ignition system. So we've got a new cap and rotor, new plug wires, new plugs, gapped and everything. Uh, and that's helping the car run a lot better. So really the biggest issue with this vehicle in particular is that it spent most of its life in a garage. So it was my great grandfather's car. And then when he passed, it got passed on to other members in our family who didn't really have a chance to drive it very often. So it spent a lot of time sitting, not running. Things would break because of that. Uh, and then when I was about 17, it got passed to me. And again, uh, not long after that, I went off to college and I wasn't <laughs> able to drive this car. So it's uh, it, just because of disuse, there's a lot of things that uh, need some love on it. And now that I finally have this car out here in Colorado, just got it, I can actually start putting some work into getting it running properly. But your car, to contrast, has been driven a lot and it's been fully maintained, which is why just about everything on yours actually works the way that it's supposed to. Well, so your car is mechanical fuel injection and when it works, it's beautiful. Uh, but, you know, they can be a little costly to keep running. Oh, big time. Um, and parts, especially on the older 70s cars, can be pretty pricey. Now, most of the 123 cars sold in the U.S. had diesel engines, and this one is no exception. Uh, so we had the 240D in the States, the 300D, and then this one, which was the 300D turbo diesel. So it's a 3-liter inline 5-cylinder. But this is probably... The biggest attraction to the 123s is it's diesel, it's super, super, super overbuilt, and it's not uncommon to see these cars with like two, three hundred thousand miles before major overhaul. So 150 is high for a classic, but for a diesel Benz, it's nothing. I mean, it really is pretty durable. When I'm, I'm of the thinking that with German vehicles especially, they're designed to be driven, they're designed to be used, and so if you just let them sit and never really run the way that they're built to, that they're actually going to deteriorate worse than if you were to use it consistently, maintain it, make sure that everything is up and running properly. That's true, and um, the cool thing about the diesels is uh, they built so many of these cars and they sold so many in the States, and uh, they're 40 years old, but there's still a lot of them around where parts are really gettable, and they're actually pretty cheap. You can get parts for these um, most places for not too much money. All right, granted, some stuff can be really expensive, like this tube I just this replaced. This oddly shaped tube. It was 40 bucks. Yeah, part of the, the research system. Downsides, of course, even a fast one like this one's pretty slow. And um, they are very clattery. Like, old Mercedes have this reputation for being buttery smooth. This is not that. I want to make that very <laughs> clear. This is like a John Deere. It's, it's very, very blah, 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 which you'll see in a second. But let's kind of step inside and talk about the interiors. Yeah. Ooh, chrome door handles. Oh, so much bright work on this car, it's fantastic. You know what's not fantastic? What's not fantastic? Is they built these climate controls using plastic levers. It's like one of the very few plastic things on this car. And so, like you can oh, see right that. here, these knobs break off all the time. So I have to go back in the dash. I have to get this actually situated in there when I hook up some new speakers that aren't uh, made out of red solo cups. And <laughs> yeah, I'll have to replace these. It's stuff like that. 
But like you were mentioning, uh, if you go for one of these older Mercedes, the older you go especially, uh, parts can be hard to find and they're expensive when you do. Right, and you don't realize like how many little bits of trim make up an interior until you have to replace a few of them. And like even on my car, some stuff can be hard to find. And I'm sure if you go, you know, into the early 70s, all the little bits, finding it in good condition will cost you probably a, a remarkable amount of money. But okay. when, when they do look good like this one, I mean, look how thick the wood is. I mean, it's like they layered <laughs> it on, like they took a whole tree and just plopped it on the dashboard. The doors are both very, very similar. Yeah. Oh yes. So um, from an interior design standpoint, this car is much, much more modern. So it's got like a molded style dash. Yeah, a lot more composites. Yeah, a lot more composites, um, which is both a good and a bad thing, right? Like, I know it's horrible. Yikes, Don't ignore bro. that, I'm gonna fix that. Um, <laughs> but the good thing about having the more modern switches and, and designs is that they are very reliable and they are pretty cheap, right? Yeah. Um, and finding parts, once again, for the interior is cheap, but much less vintage look overall. Like you have that really thin, elegant dash design with the, the gobs of wood. This is more of like, uh, you know, a thin kind of layer of wood versus just right. a tree. It looks considerably more modern. Uh, but again, the thing that I do like is just, uh, there, you don't see all those kind of funky gaps that I see in my car. And then looking at your whole headliner design, this, this is gorgeous, all this. Is, I'm assuming this is leather, right? Yeah. That's what it looks like. And you've got a sunroof, dude. All right, let's go ahead and get them on the road and talk about what they drive like. So, Case, walk me through these seat belts. So we're going to yes. use the bottom portion, but how do you Here. use the full thing? Uh, I, will, I will hold it up so the camera can see uh, <laughs> if I can get it to retract so I can extend it again. Yes, okay. Yeah, so you got your little jimmy and you put it in the john. Um, you just like slide it in and bonk. It clicks back and stays in place, oh, but, but, uh, you but it's, it's really the... obnoxious and it gets in the way. And um, if it rubs against our microphones, then uh, editor Ian will kill us. So <laughs> we're just gonna skip them. All right, let's let's hear this beast. Oh, what a machine! Started up first try. Actually, the, time. the fuel injection is a great thing at altitude. Why does my door lock not want to go down? Is my door not closed? There we go. There they go. So you've got vacuum on your door locks. I've got vacuum for my door locks, my cruise control, my engine shut off. Right. Um, what not, else? My not necessarily what you want to hear. Oh, I uh, know. I'm sure there's probably other stuff on this car that's vacuum, but uh, the only time I had to have the vacuum system messed with, I exported that work because I just, ooh, I did not want to touch the vacuum <laughs> system on this car. You know what's amazing is it looks to be huge from the outside, but once you're in it, it's a narrow machine. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because our, our like our interior um, has enough room that we're not bumping elbows or anything, but it is a surprisingly narrow car. It's not short, it is long. This, this is a, a long car. But um, yeah, you know, it drives surprisingly well for its size and age. I definitely need to go through uh, and do bushings on this car. I need to fix the header leak that's taken away up front. I need to bleed the brakes. I ordered a new set of Coker tires for this car, but tires are impossible to get. So there's a lot of things I'm waiting on, but um, there's full throttle. It's not quick. No. There's a lot of torque. I mean, well, the funny thing is it accelerates as well <laughs> at 60 miles per hour as it does at 15. That's uh, interesting. Yeah, it's the same amount of acceleration no matter how fast you're going. This is such a refined experience though. I mean, it just kind of wafts along. Yeah. Steering, I'm sure, is what, super light or is it actually pretty? Uh, it's not crazy light. It's not like a John Deere tractor light, but okay. um, That's interesting. Yeah. the steering on this car is really good. Um, yeah, it rides pretty well, uh, but it definitely needs a bit of love. All right, welcome to the world of boring seatbelts. Yeah, this feels familiar. And um, what won't feel familiar is glowing the plugs. <laughs> that noise. Oh yeah, picking up the kids from the school on the school bus right there. So in all seriousness, it is a very, very loud engine. Yeah. Um, the plus side is, so as we mentioned, I mean, it goes for freaking ever. I love that it's got a sunroof, man. Yeah, it's also one of those like old school style where it's a steel panel yeah. <laughs> versus having glass show through it, you know? So it's only a sunroof when it's open. Right. I think in a lot of ways this drives like a more modern car too. Um, yeah. You know, I think like the steering's probably a little crisper, the ride is certainly a little firmer. Um, and let's see, full throttle. Yes, 
probably quicker. Yeah, it's definitely quicker. Um, well, like you said, my car's got some torque. This has got even more. Yeah, only when the turbo hits, though, from like... Oh, man, when you first get rolling in this it's car. so slow. I, the first time I drove it, and there's a video of this, I thought the parking brake was on. <laughs> yeah, genuinely, you're right. It does feel like you're dragging an anchor, uh, and that could be because of our altitude. But once you get it to, like... 2,500 RPM, it revs it all the way to, it revs to like 5,000, yeah. which is a lot for a diesel. Now, I wouldn't say that this is sporty, and yeah. the ride is still very, very soft. Just probably not as soft as yours. Yeah, just relative to my car, it's sporty. But both of these cars, I mean, they feel like bank volts. I mean, there's oh. so much mass to them. This is back when Mercedes was the version of Mercedes that was creating that kind of renowned... You know, you're buying this German quality and like you said, like a bank vault. Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, problems with these cars are, like we said, the vacuum systems can be a disaster. Yes. Uh, climate controls can be a disaster. The thing about a 123 is everything will fail on it, but it will still get you home. Um, it may get to the point where I actually have to open the hood to turn the engine off, but I can almost guarantee that it will get you home in a smoky cloud of soot. At yeah. least one way or another, which is a cool thing. Um, just not quite as vintage as a 108. Yeah. So case, uh, mine was 6,500 bucks and now they're probably like eight to nine for, for one in similar condition. So a more affordable car than yours. Yours is now really nice and much more expensive. Um, probably cheaper to run too long term. Yeah, I would say definitely cheaper to run. I mean, the nice thing about the W123 is that that is a modern enough vehicle that if you wanted to daily drive it, you could. I, I, I definitely think you could. This, I mean, in theory, you could daily drive it, but I'm not, I'm not sure that I would. If you want to go on a Sunday cruise, go to a car show, impress people with a very just pretty thing, I think that does it perfectly. Oh, yeah. If you want a much more usable vehicle, I'd go for yours. Yeah, right. And it just depends on what kind of vintage you're looking for, how much you're going to drive it. Um, and you know what you're looking to get out of your classic car. Neither of them are fast, so I will say that much. Yeah, they're All not right. sports cars. <laughs> Let us know which one you prefer in the comment section below. This has been Tommy and Case. Check out TFO Classics for part two, where we're going to bring them to a mechanic and see what a mechanic thinks of them underneath, uh, throughout, under the engine bay, and talk about which one is actually better by from a mechanical standpoint.